Hello again. <clears throat> My name is Mav, and we've been sharing Jericho, Vermont's birds. And there are many birds in Jericho, Vermont. In the ABCs of Jericho Birds 1, the first part, uh, we went from A through brilliantly colored Orioles. And now we're going to start out with some more of the O's for Oh Wow. And that is Jericho's quiet colored owls. Three kinds of owls make Jericho their home. And the last one on that, this list is the least common. The most common are barred owls. And they're well named because they have bars everywhere. They have vertical bars and horizontal bars and even some diagonal bars. These birds can be seen and heard any time of the day. We always think of owls as only night birds, but these birds hunt both in the day and the night. We heard one a little past noon while walking in the Jericho Town Forest. Their characteristic call sounds like who cooks for you. It goes, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you? But they also make a very loud hoo and many, many, many other sounds. In general, barred owls prefer to stay in mature forests. That's where they'd like to be. But during winters with a lot of deep snow or with ice on top of the snow, they have difficulty getting to the small rodents that live under the snowpack. And then the owls might come closer to human homes and hang out near bird feeders like the one on the right did. Watching for little creatures that dig themselves out of their tunnels at night to pick up dropped seed under the feeders. The bird on the left actually caught a rabbit right in our driveway one very hard winter. That's a very, very large prey for a barred owl. They usually prefer things they can swallow whole. Jericho also gets some great horned owls. Those aren't really horns, by the way. They're just tufts of feathers. Great horned owls are considerably bigger and heavier than the um, barred owls, and they are almost exclusively nocturnal. They're usually heard at dusk and right before dawn. And the great horned owls have a deep, hollow, sort of stuttering hoot that sounds a bit like hoo 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 but deeper than that. They start courting and breeding in February. So that's when they're often heard, or maybe a little earlier. And there seems to be one breeding pair, at least, in the vicinity of Jericho Center, because people on Plains Road and in Jericho Center and at the UVM Research Forest all have heard those haunting hollow calls very often in the month before I made this video. Great horned owls are 18 to, 50 to 25 inches long. They're pretty big. These little guys are pretty tiny. They're only seven to eight inches long. That's not too much bigger than, well, it's about the same size as a blue jay in length, although they're chubbier. Northern saw wet owls are pretty secretive. So there are probably more around than are being seen but they have been seen or heard on Plains Road or Pack and Packard Road and Silly Hill Road. Their noise is sort of like the beep, beep, beep of a truck backing up, but it's a slightly deeper tone. And the youngsters are downright adorable, I think. This is a wonderful picture. And I should say now that many uh, Vermont birders and photographers generously donate photos for the videos, classes, and programs that I do. And if they're not labeled, they were taken either by me or by my partner, Bernie Paquette. Uh, most of the unlabeled ones are his. Saw wet owls have to be secretive because they're small enough to be preyed on by great horned owls, 
as well as some hawks and some falcons. They usually nest in holes that were made by flickers or woodpeckers, but they sometimes use man-made nest boxes. We put up one of those boxes two years ago, and we are still hoping that it attracts a pair of these little owls. The word saw wet, by the way, is supposed to come from the sound they make, but I don't hear it as anything to do with, with sawing or uh, sharpening a saw, which is what it's supposed to sound like. <clears throat> Before seeing more of Jericho's beautiful birds, let's pause for a message from our sponsor, those very beautiful birds of Jericho, Vermont. P is for planting. We all know that populations of many of Vermont's songbirds are in sharp decline. And one reason is that there is simply not enough protein-rich food for birds to feed their young. And that's a problem every one of us can help with. Plants that evolved here in Vermont evolved along with native caterpillars and that is the primary food for growing birds. A native oak tree can host as many as 400 different species of caterpillars. Willows that evolved here in the state might host even more species of caterpillars. Those plants sold as pest-free in so many garden stores probably don't get nibbled by Vermont's insects, that's true but they provide next to nothing for Vermont's birds and other wildlife. In addition to hosting nature's baby formula, caterpillars, plants that have a long history right here in Jericho, Vermont, provide many other things that our birds need. Nesting materials, nesting locations, small fruits that are good for them instead of just passing right through their bodies, and small seeds. So every single insect-friendly and bird-friendly plant that we can put into the ground will help our birds in so many different ways. Unfortunately, many local nurseries don't stock native plants at all, <laughs> and many of the people working in nurseries don't have a lot of information about going native. Here are two places there are many more, but here are two places to find some good suggestions for planting right here. You can go to the National Audubon Society website and go to native, ask for native plants, search for it, type in your uh, zip code, and you'll come up with a long list of suggested plants that would do well here in Vermont, grow well because they're adapted to this area, and be good for our wildlife. And Prairie Moon Nursery is one that we've found that has lots of uh, suggestions. You just go to their website and type in Vermont and you'll find a large list. Now back to our program, we're up to Q already. Q is for quail. And Jericho has no breeding or nesting quails. Sometimes people use the word quail for grouse um, but that's a whole different family of birds. However, we have had a few visits from northern bob whites, like in this picture, and they are truly quails. They were apparently escapees from game farms. In 2010, I was walking at Mob's farm and I was astonished to hear a loud, unmistakable bob white, bob white. I'd never heard that call, but I knew what it was instantly. I came home and checked. Yep, that was a Bob White call, but they don't grow around here. But the next day, probably that same Bob White spent at least an hour on the ridgeline of my barn calling. And the day after that, the quail was calling from the Jericho Center Green. So it's always possible that another will visit someday soon. Now, American robins are members of the thrush family, and we'll see more thrushes under T. But robins are so well known and so well loved that they deserve their own section here. So R is for robin. 
Robins are familiar sights all over Jericho. And the males and females, by the way, look very similar to us. The females tend to have a slightly paler color black on their head. <laughs> they can be seen all year round, even in the winter. And in spring, we've probably all found bits of blue-green robin eggs on the ground, or we found a robin's nest. A few years ago, a robin nested right on the porch at Jericho Country Store, visible there in the upper right corner. Our town has even had a very unique robin, a bird that was seen at Jericho Settlers Farm. Melanin is the substance in humans and other uh, animals that makes plumage or hair or eyes dark. Well, this robin was leucistic. That means it had some melanin, but not as much melanin as others of its species. So it had a white head and part of its belly was white. Really interesting looking bird. S is for a lot of things, sparrows, starlings, swifts, and swallows, and even shorebirds. Yes, shorebirds here far from any ocean shoreline. We'll start with a much maligned starling. Way back in the 1800s, some homesick Englishmen living in New York City asked friends back home to send over cages of every single kind of bird mentioned in the plays and poems of William Shakespeare. Well, most of those poor displaced birds died, but a few just loved their new country and their numbers exploded. And there are now millions of European starlings in the United States. They look mostly just black from a distance, but they have beautiful colors when seen up close, gold and black and turquoise and green and shimmery silver. And their, their bills during uh, courtship season are bright yellow. Sparrows are also sometimes dissed, I have to say, because they may be difficult to tell apart. They're at least overlooked. Some people call them LBJs for little brown jobs, and they don't even try to tell apart the different LBJs around here. But there is, is actually quite a lot of diversity among uh, Vermont's uh, Jericho sparrows. In the summertime, <clears throat> the most common are chipping sparrows and um, song sparrows, both shown on this slide. Chipping sparrows will be coming back to Vermont um, probably at the beginning of April. Song sparrows also, but some of them stay around all year. Both birds can be seen in tree-lined backyards. Song sparrows in particular are really quite comfortable around humans. We've had them nest in hydrangea bushes, lilacs, a big wygella, um, a um, native um, high bush cranberry. They perch on a tree or they come to the top of our pole bean poles and serenade us while we're gardening. And we also get to enjoy the new fledglings, messy looking little things that don't even have tails yet. They're not strong flyers at this age, but they can flutter from shrub to shrub. During spring and fall migration, we here in Jericho might luck out and get to see a large and beautiful fox sparrow, named obviously after that fox color. The woods trails at Mills Riverside Park are sometimes a good place to see these birds. In the winter, American tree sparrows and white-throated sparrows can show up at backyard feeding stations. White-throated sparrows are well-named. Their white throats are always noticeable. There are two kinds, though. One has black and white stripes on the top of their heads, like this one, and one has brown and tan stripes. And you might see both during a winter in Jericho or at your end at your feeders. 
For some reason that hasn't been quite discovered by scientists yet, a white-throated sparrow with a black and white head will almost always choose one with a brown and tan head as a mate, and vice versa. American tree sparrows, are, they're just so cute. They're one of my favorites, the upper left picture. They can be recognized by that little reddish cap, the blotch in the middle of a whitish gray chest, and a two-tone bill, dark on the top and yellowish on the bottom. These little birds nest and raise young on the far northern Canadian tundra. They come down to Vermont in the winter, just the way some Vermont humans head south to Florida. Ah, it's so nice and warm here. Swifts and swallows are fast flying, flitting, insect eating birds. Chimney swifts, like the sort of odd picture in the top left, have been described as flying cigars uh, because of that shape. These birds are almost always heard high in the air and they're never seen perched in a tree because they can't perch. The only thing their little feet can do is to hang on inside chimneys, that's where they got their name, or hollow trees. And it's very difficult to get photos of them. I asked that the um, other birders if they have any photos and no one had any except that distant one. Two kinds of swallows are seen often here in Jericho and tree swallows like these two beauties are the most common. They arrive back in late March or early April and barn swallows come about a few weeks later. Tree swallows nest in tree cavities but they will happily move into boxes that people put out for bluebirds. Barn swallows, as the name suggests, often nest in human structures, including barns, bridges, wharves, culverts, and light fixtures like the pair on, on the left. These birds make nest cups out of pellets of mud, and then they line the cups with grass and feathers. In flight, barn swallows can be recognized by the long, long forked tails. I don't know if that couple on the left, by the way, kept continued working on the nest there once they found out that light is on all night long. That's on the uh, visitor center at um, Burton Island State Park. S is also for shorebird and all kinds of shorebird pass through Vermont during spring and fall migration, because many, many songbirds, excuse me, shorebirds nest on the Canadian tundra and spend the summers way south, and winters rather, way south of here. One of the kinds that has been seen passing through are the well-named yellow legs. A few shorebird family members nest here. The most familiar of these has got to be the killdeer, a member of the shorebird family that is almost never seen on the seashore. Killdeer like grassy fields and golf courses and driveways and ballparks. <laughs> they even nest on the flat gravel tops of buildings. A pair has nested on part of uh, Heinsberg Elementary School for many years now. This is a killdeer nest. If you look closely, you can see two eggs. They do not build a comfy nest. They just heap up some stones or, or uh, make a little depression. If we had stepped any closer to this killdeer nest, one of the two watchful parents would have drooped its tail and then maybe drooped one of its wings and moved away making pitiful noises, pretending to be injured and easy prey so it could lure us into following it and getting away from the nest. Spotted sandpipers have been seen in many parts of Jericho, including often along the stream at Mob's farm. These birds walk along the edge of streams or rivers or bodies of water, constantly bobbing their tails. And their flight when they take off is very recognizable. They fly just a foot or so above the water sort of a jerky, stuttering flight, blip, 
Mlilip, with little glides. Two odd looking and very long beaked members of the shorebird family nest right here in Jericho, but they are pretty secretive about nesting, which makes sense. Wilson's snipes have been seen in many locations, including right at our house in Jericho Center, at Mob's Farm, along Fields Lane, right next to the parking lot at Jericho Settlers Farm. They tend to hang out in wet areas and to attract females on spring evenings, the males fly back and forth over the wetlands at dawn and dusk, making a characteristic noise that's called winnowing. So if you hear that in the next couple of months, in late April probably, um, you'll know that you have a snipe nearby. American woodcock used to be called timber doodles, which is a really cute name because they are often found in forests. These charmingly odd chubby little birds nest in young shrubby woods and mixed forest agricultural areas. Woodcocks have been seen at Mobs Park, um, from Varney Road and Pratt Road, at Kekus Valley Farm, and one time in a driveway right here in Jericho Center. That one, the one in the driveway, was doing the timber doodle dance. A slow step forward, bounce up and down a few times, another step forward, another few bounces. Male woodcocks do an amazing sky dance in the spring. A few males together choose a small clearing in the woods or on the edge of a field as a place to strut their stuff for the watching quiet females that gather. Then they rocket up into the air and flutter back to the earth, making a lovely mix of chirps and whistles and kissing sounds. And I'm hoping you can hear these. That was one woodcock, one male woodcock, on his flight back to ground. And then he'd land, and then he'd do this funny peent, peent, and then he'd fly up and start all over again. T is for turkeys also, as well as all the other things we've seen. Flocks of wild turkeys have been seen all over Jericho, including along Plains Road and Chillhammer Road and up and down Bolger Hill. These big birds are absolutely unmistakable, even without the flaring tail of an amorous or aggressive male. One very cold November day, four turkeys showed up under our bird feeders only a few yards from the house, cleaning up dropped seed. Tea is also for thrushes. And Jericho has several members of the thrush family in addition to the robins we saw a few minutes ago. We've got veeries and wood thrushes and hermit thrushes, gray catbirds and eastern bluebirds like that picture. Hermit thrushes can be seen or heard at most of the forested public places in town, usually right before dusk. These are shy birds. Yeah, you have to stand still in one place and just look into the forest undergrowth to, to try to see them. And wood thrushes are even shyer. These are not easily found, but their haunting songs fill the air in the evenings in many of our wooded areas. Veeries are likely to be seen in wooded areas close to water, such as Mob's Farm in the, the woods in the dark, excuse me, in the um, the woods near the stream. And here at our house, we have woods in back of us and across the street and a wetland to the north. And that's a really great batch of habitats for veeries. So we very often hear them all around us. And I believe they nest in the woods in back of us. One year in late July or August, when the young came out, we heard veeries 
all around the yard, probably um, about five of them. Here's their haunting, downward spiraling song. Seeing a, whoops, I skipped over a very pretty bird. Seeing a bluebird always feels like a sign of good fortune. I think almost everybody feels that, not even, I mean, people who aren't normally bird watchers. Many people put out boxes for these beautiful small thrushes. This is the male. The female is a little quieter colored, quite a bit quieter colored. The, the um, males have those robin red breasts and the females are mostly grayish brown. This bird was in a tree at the Jericho Center Cemetery. And other good places to see Eastern bluebirds all year round are along Fitzsimons Road and along Shillhammer Road. <clears throat> we have nesting catbirds on our property, not nesting bluebirds, alas. And we love having catbirds here. We like their call, which is sort of like a cat meowing and their songs, which can imitate many other kinds of birds. Catbirds eat insects during summer breeding season, but they also like to try many different kinds of fruit. And in the fall, we see them chowing down on our wild grapes, getting ready for their flight to the Carolinas or Georgia or Florida, where they're gonna spend the winter. Now you, is for unusual. These are birds that show up only now and then, in winters where there isn't enough food for them to stay north of here in their usual territories. Winter 2022-23 has been a great year for evening gross beaks like the one in this picture. Big, bold birds that showed up in our yard in early December and were around for many weeks. This grosbeak is a female, again, quiet colors for females. And the males have that same big bill or gross beak, but much brighter colors. Pine grosbeaks are also occasional visitors. They love eating the dried fruit of ornamental crabapple trees. So that's a good place to look for these birds in late winter. And both red cross bills and white winged cross bills sometimes show up in Jericho. We had some in the big huge spruces across the street from us a few years ago. I think they were white winged. This photo shows the characteristic crossed bill. And those allow the birds to get into tightly closed cones and extract the tasty and nutritious seeds inside. And every few years, common red poles show up in flocks that can number over a hundred. Both sexes of these cute little birds have that little red cap like this one. This is a female. And the males also have pink or reddish breasts. These little guys can survive in incredibly low temperatures. I forgot what I read, but I think they're okay down to 50 below um, Fahrenheit. On one very cold morning, I watched, considerably befuddled, as the foot deep snow on the barn roof heaved and, and wiggled and wriggled and moved. And then over 20 red poles flew out from under the snow, shook off the snow and descended on the bird feeders. They had been keeping warm overnight clustered together under a blanket of snow. I had a touching and very satisfying experience with this little common red pole male a few winters ago. I went outdoors on a frigid morning to fill the bird feeders and this little bird was lying on the ground, apparently dead. I thought maybe it flew against the house and knocked itself out, or maybe it had been knocked out of the sky by a raptor, a bird that eats uh, other birds, catches live prey, and then had frozen. But I picked it up, hoping, and brought it indoors and put it in a box in the living room, not too many feet from our wood stove. 
After about 40 minutes, there was a fluttering noise coming from inside the box. I waited a bit more and then looked, and this little bird looked pretty alert. I took the box outdoors and held him in my hand. The bird blinked, looked around, made a little hop, and then just took off fast and flew in a straight line for the woods in back of our house. And I felt so fortunate that I'd gone out at exactly the right minute to find him before he totally froze. Whoops, sorry, I lost part of the... There we go. I'm going to have to skip past a lot now to get back to the red poles. The one That one year that we had red poles, it's impossible to count them because they never stopped moving. But I think we had over 120 at our feeders almost every single day. <clears throat> There's another unusual bird, a bird that comes to Jericho only now and then, and it's an owl. Could have mentioned it back for O's, but it's so irregular here in, in Vermont that I thought we'd put it under unusual. Snowy owls come down to Canada only in years when there are too many owls for the available food supply. We usually get only the immature owls, so they're not all snowy. They look sort of like this. They've been reported only twice in Jericho. They sort of like wide open agricultural land and we just don't have very much of that anymore. But they are definitely too amazing not to include. So we've gone from A through U, unusual. And V is for Vireo, like this little red-eyed Vireo, well-named nipping Mark Labar's finger at a bird banding demonstration at the Audubon Center in Huntington. Birds are caught in nets there and weighed and measured and then given leg bands that will help scientists learn about their migration and their breeding habits. Vireos are smaller than robins, but a lot bigger than hummingbirds. We don't see them very often and they're all over the place because they hide up in the treetops. They are heard much more often than they're seen. Red-eyed vireos are incessant singers, calling up to 20,000 times a day. I'm up here in a tree, you can't see, he, he, he. That's how what I hear them saying. Jericho's two other vireos also sing a lot. This little warbling vireo on her nest, of course, was completely quiet. She didn't want to call attention to her nest or her eggs. W is for woodpeckers, wrens, and warblers. Downy and hairy woodpeckers look very similar, but downies, like this one, are smaller, and their bills are noticeably smaller in comparison to their heads. The males of both species have a bit of red on their heads, the females don't have. See how much longer and heftier um, this hairy woodpecker's bill is. They were named hairy and downy, by the way, um, because of the, the, the feathers they have right above their, their bill. The downy um, woodpecker's feathers there are really soft and the hairies are sort of like bristles. It might be quite easy to confuse downy and hairy woodpeckers, but pileated woodpeckers or pileated, it's right both ways, are unmistakable. They are huge. From one wingtip to the other is almost 30 inches. Ants are their favorite food, carpenter ants very often. And we often see really huge, deep trenches in trees where the huge woodpeckers have been feasting. The photo on the left was taken in early December one year. The one in the middle is that same tree only nine days later. And the rightmost photo shows two of the family of pileated woodpeckers that was gorging themselves on the carpenter ants. They ended up making three holes, each one about 14 inches deep and about 20 inches long. This series of woodpecker, uh, woodpecker photos always makes me grin. This was taken through a window, so it's a little blurry. 
but a young pileated woodpecker sticks its head out of the nest hole. Hey, where's food? And then he's joined by a sister or brother, both of them complaining loudly that they're near starvation. And they are finally rewarded when mom comes with some tasty, nutritious food. Northern flickers are related to woodpeckers. I think these photographs are glorious. Many flickers leave our area by December, but a few have been seen every month of the year. The extraordinary photo on the right shows why these birds are called yellow shafted. They've got a great deal of yellow on the shafts of their wing feathers. Downies and harries and pileated woodpeckers are in Jericho year round but many of our flickers fly a few hundred miles south when the really cold weather comes. Most yellow-bellied sapsuckers also fly south because they are, as their name suggests, <laughs> sap suckers. They live off tree sap and the tiny insects that are trapped in the sap. So they have to leave when it gets too cold, cold for sap to keep flowing if they keep um, opening new holes. And you can tell that a sapsucker has been around whenever you see many, many little round holes all the way around a tree. Those holes are called sap wells. And other animals use those wells to drink the tasty sap, including bats and porcupines. And hummingbirds actually time their arrival in Jericho to go along with the sapsuckers. So if there aren't any flowers out yet, the sap suckers, excuse me, the hummingbirds can drink sap from the sap wells. Red-bellied woodpeckers are another species that weren't around in Vermont until fairly recently. We mentioned some in the first part of, of this video series. Um, titmice weren't around and a few other species. I think that red-bellied woodpeckers were first seen in the state in the first decade of this century, or maybe toward the end of the 1900s. But they have quickly expanded. And now they show up in a wide swath through the eastern half of the western half of the state, rather, and along the Connecticut River Valley in the east. They're not common in Jericho, but one has been seen many times at a home around along Nashville Road. So it's definitely wise to, to keep looking for them. These birds are really misnamed. Don't look for a red belly. Instead, look for a medium-sized woodpecker with a light-colored belly and lots of black and white barring on the back and the wings. The males are red on the nape and crown, like these photos. The females are red only on the nape. W is also for wrens, and we have three kinds here in Jericho. House wrens nest in a wide variety of crevices and holes, old woodpecker holes, madman nesting boxes, even discarded tin cans or shoes. This is a species that is very comfortable with humans. At our house, we hear and see house wrens from May until August every year. The busy, busy little males filling more than three nest boxes of twigs so that the female can choose the one that she thinks is best. The males and females both bringing food to their young, and later on the males and females both bringing food to the hungry fledglings that are out of the nest and all over the yard begging. I love this little guy, <laughs> out in the big wide world for the first time in his life. That pale color on part of its beak is a target for parent birds so they can instantly see the wide open mouths when they poke their heads into a dark nest box with some tasty, tasty insect. <clears throat> Carolina wrens, as the name suggests, used to be a Southern species, but now they can be found all the way from Eastern Texas, way up into Northern Vermont. They started expanding their range northward in the mid 1900s, maybe because of gradually warming winter temperatures, they, they don't really like cold weather, maybe because of forest fragmentation, they don't really like deep forests, 
maybe because of reforestation, because they don't like open fields either, <laughs> both fragmentation and planting new trees creates the tangled shrubby habitat that these birds do love. This Carolina wren visited our bird feeders for several weeks a few winters ago. And this is a bird, by the way, that sings in the winter and so many don't. There's a lovely poem about, I heard a, word, a, a wren sing in the dark of December. Um, I forgot the rest of it, but it ends with, it's easy to, it helps us remember that spring is coming. <laughs> Jericho has one other kind of wren, and I don't have a picture of it, but this little drawing is so beautiful, a little painting. These are tiny little brown balls of energy called winter wrens, and they have astonishingly long and bubbly songs, very loud for tiny little things. Unlike our two other wrens, winter wrens do not hang out near humans at all. They like forests with lots of evergreen trees and lots of fallen logs and tangled twigs all over the ground. Winter wrens nest at Mobs Farm and Old Mill Park and have been seen or heard more often in several other locations. This artist, Annette uh, Goyne, has taken some of my classes about birds and she makes lovely greeting cards and framed prints uh, that are available down near Montgomery, where she lives, um, and in Miller's Thumb in Greensboro. And I really thank her for this drawing. W is also for warbler. Warblers are amazing. They come in all sorts of colors. They come in brilliant red and orange and dark red and dark black and white and uh, lime green and uh, apple green, forest green, and cerulean blue and they're they're incredible and they're generally small generally active and the males are generally bright colored there are exceptions to all those generalies and almost two dozen kinds of warblers have been seen here in jericho some stay here to nest many others just pass through in spring and fall as they move between their winter territories in Central or South America and breeding areas in Canada. We're going to look only at some of the more familiar warblers, beauties that we have seen many times in our own backyard. Common yellow throats have nested in our backyard for at least the last 25 years, I think. The males are instantly identifiable with their black masks and bright yellow throats. Females and immatures also have yellow throats. The newly fledged youngster on the right is begging his mother to feed him now. They, these birds, I wouldn't say they're comfortable with people, but they come out to find out what people are doing all the time if you walk near them and they, they uh, make scolding noises at you. <laughs> American red starts are active little warblers, really active, always flitting from tree to tree. I really think the males should be called orange starts rather than red starts because they are black and orange. Females have dark gray instead of black and yellow instead of orange. Two great places to see American red starts close to us are along the short volunteer park trail and the longer Beacon River Shore Preserve Trail, both in Richmond. Those are both just red start alleys. Or right here in our backyard, where they've nested for several years now. I don't think we've ever had a yellow rumped warbler nest here, probably because we don't have any good-sized conifers quite yet. But during fall migration, these well-named warblers are all over the place. The males in breeding plumage are dramatic black and white and yellow. Females are quieter, tan and gray and white. But every one of the yellow rump warblers has that yellow rump that earned them the nickname butter butts. The numbers of Cape May warblers are down at least 70% since the 1960s. 
So I was really excited and delighted when one of our neighbors came over one day, showed me a photo on his cell phone, and asked me what that bird was. And then I was even more excited when he told me the bird was hanging out in their cherry tree, had been there for at least an hour. <laughs> Bernie and I raced across the street, and Bernie took over two dozen photos of the beautiful Cape May warbler. Since then, we've seen them several times in our ancient plum trees and apple trees, eating, of course, uh, little tiny caterpillars. And the males are black and yellow with a prominent necklace of stripes and a chestnut colored um, cheek patch. But females and immatures, which we've seen many of, look like this. And two more of the almost two dozen species of warblers that show up in Jericho. Black-throated blue warblers, that's a male, the females are sort of nondescript colored, and black-throated green warblers, and the males and females look quite similar of this species. They both nest in forest woodlands, but the black-throated greens sometimes hang out in rural backyards. Well, we're down to X, Y, and Z. Jericho doesn't have any birds starting with those letters, but we can use X for wax wings. These beautiful and gregarious birds chow down on sumac berries, mountain ash, wild grapes, and ornamental fruit trees. Cedar wax wings are around all year and nest here. Bohemian wax wings are winter visitors. The two wax wing species look superficially alike. They're both colorful and beautiful with little crests and black masks and yellow at the ends of their tails. But bohemian waxwings like this are heftier. They're sort of like cedar waxwings on steroids. One excellent field mark for bohemian waxwings is a bright brick red color under the tail, which is just barely visible in this photo. And what is Y for? Why enjoy birds? <laughs> there have been scores of studies in the past 20 years or so about the effects of nature on human health. Exercise, blood pressure, stress, reducing anxiety. Um, there's even possibility that being out in nature reduces inflammation and helps all the many diseases that have to do with inflammation and strengthen the immune system. If you Google nature's benefits or benefits of outdoors, you will find article after article. In Shetland, Scotland, the National Health Service even has a nature prescriptions program. Doctors prescribe walks in nature to supplement traditional medicine for many different kinds of ailments. And of course, I think we've all read about Japan's forest bathing which has been proven to do wonderful things for people's mental and physical health. Doesn't mean bathing, it means just being in a forest. I can't think of any birds with Z in their name any closer to Jericho than the Florida Keys. So Z will be for zest. We have seen almost a hundred species of birds. All can be seen right here in our own Jericho, Vermont. Over 300 species have been seen in Chittenden County. Over 400 in the state of Vermont as a whole. There is a wealth of bird life all around us. Wouldn't it be fun to de dedicate the rest of the year to enjoying them? This can be the year of the bird. Here are some tips for enjoying and seeing birds. First, move quietly so you don't startle wildlife. Look at everything around you. Let the birds come to you. A well-known birder who lives way far away in India once wrote, bird watching is the fine art of becoming invisible. He wrote that nature holds its breath when a human first appears. And then after a while, nature relaxes and returns to its natural activities. Getting a good pair of binoculars will add a lot to your birding, really a lot, but not all models work for all people, and it can be hard to find ones that work for you. I don't recommend ordering a model online that you've never tried out. 
If possible, take a walk with a few other birders and ask if you can look through their binoculars, or at least ask others for advice. Then you can search binoculars for birding and find recommended models in many different price ranges with information about the pros and the cons. I have a good friend who just bought her first really good pair of binoculars, and she tried out four pairs that friends had before she made her decision. Once you have a pair of binoculars, take the time to calibrate them. That's something you do to make the binoculars perfect for your specific eyes, for the distance between your eyes, for any differences between your eyes, for how you use your eyes, and there are good instructions on calibrating binoculars on the web. For some reason I can't turn, there we go, turn the page. Here are some more suggestions. <clears throat> in fall and winter, any time of the day is okay for birding. You're gonna find birds here and there everywhere, any time rather. But if you wanna see really a lot of birds and it's spring, starting in around late April, the early morning is the best time to be out. The air is full of bird song, the so-called dawn chorus. Birds have so much to talk about at that time of the year. They're finding nesting territories. They're announcing that they're willing to defend those territories. They're looking for mates. They're actively courting each other. They're mating. They're looking for good nest sites and nest materials. All that song is aimed at each other, not at us, but the noises help us locate the birds and then enjoy looking at them. So go out early to see springtime birds. And if you're going for a walk in a natural area, it's best to leave your dog at home. I love dogs. I keep having lovely memories of our 80 plus pound mixed breed, Arf. The kids named him Arf racing toward me in a field, the wind blowing his hair back so he could see the bright laughing eyes, his tongue lolling out of his mouth. Arf was completely happy every single minute of his long life. But I didn't take him with me on bird walks. Because even when dogs are leashed and very well behaved, they still signal danger, danger, danger to wildlife that evolved along with wolves and foxes and coyotes. Danger, danger. And then their humans don't get to see anything on the walk but their own dog and plants. And as for cell phones, lots of people now have an app called Merlin. It is truly amazing. You can turn on your phone, start Merlin, choose sound ID, and a computer program will identify the bird noises around you. If you've got Merlin and love it, by all means, take it along. Knowing what birds are singing around you will widen your understanding of what's here in Jericho. Merlin does make errors though, so people should consider it as a wonderful tool, but not as absolute truth. One of the funniest errors was a woman who was carrying her baby on a, in a pack and the baby made a little funny noise um, and the yeah, Merlin immediately identified it as a great blue heron taking off. Some people also have apps that are birding field guides. They're the same thing as the book field guides, but they're, they're an app. And they're, they're easier to carry than books, and they have sound as well as pictures and text. So if you love being able to turn on an app and remind yourself what a rose-breasted grosbeak female looks like, that's great. But don't give in to playing bird song a lot while you're outdoors, because hearing what sounds like another of its own species can lead a bird away from vitally important behaviors like courtship and mating and finding food and eating and feeding young. So, so try to avoid doing that. We have lots of great habitats in Jericho. Here's a list of some to explore. I put Mills Riverside Park in parentheses because it's um it's sort of hit or miss. If you happen to get there when there are a lot of free running dogs in every section of the park, not just in the off leash area, and that happens often, you're apt to see not a single bird. 
But if you're lucky enough to get there where there aren't a lot of dogs, or when all the dogs are with responsible owners, then you can see some wonderful bird life there. So you wanna know more about Jericho's birds? The next batch of slides have some suggestions for further study. And following the slides are some resources that you might find interesting and helpful because there's so much study that people can do for, for homeschooling, for school projects, or just for fun. Be fun to find out what birds here in Jericho will accept a man-made nesting box or what birds make cup-shaped nests and what birds make nests that hang down looking like limp socks, or what birds that might make nests completely out of mud. What species of young, of birds rather, have precocial young? That is, they're fully feathered, they have open eyes, and they can move around on their own as soon as they get out of the egg. And what species have altricial young, like those in the picture, blind and featherless and helpless? Caterpillars are vitally important for the survival of many, many bird species. They're the perfect food for baby birds. They're not fast, so the birds can catch them easily. They don't have hard exoskeletons, hard exteriors like beetles, so that they're easy to digest. They're nice and soft, so it's easy for adult birds to bend them and stuff them down the throats of their chicks. They're incredibly nutritious, providing essential protein for growing little bodies. How many of Jericho birds de depend on caterpillars to feed their young? Are there any that don't depend on caterpillars? If they don't, what do they feed their young? Which of Jericho's birds show sexual dimorphism. That's when the adult males and the adult females look different to us humans. What species aren't sexually dimorphic so that the adult males and the adult females look identical to us? I just said that males and females in some species look different to us humans. Why would I say us humans? Do birds see differently than we do? There's been a lot of study that shows that they hear differently than we do. This would be an interesting thing to find out. <clears throat> when do Jericho birds start nesting? What do Jericho eggs look like? These, by the way, I'll tell you, these were right next door and they are the eggs of a common yellow throat. And they were the nest was just a few, maybe a foot above the ground, maybe even less. There are a lot of bird species in the video that weren't around in Vermont at all 100 years ago. And some of them weren't even around 50 years ago, and some of them are even newer than that. Which species are newcomers? And what changes or factors might have brought them here? When European explorers and settlers came to this area, they assigned names to the birds they saw. Even though all those birds were well known to the Vermonters who already lived here, the Abenaki, and they already had names. See if you can find out what some of our birds were called prior to European colonization. Birds feature in a lot of Native American myths and stories, and they are really interesting to read. So it'd be fun to look up some of them and read some of the stories. The populations of many North American birds have decreased significantly in the last 60 years. Which of our species here in Vermont are much less abundant than they used to be? Are there any that are increasing in numbers? You can find answers to those last questions in the Vermont Breeding Bird Atlas. The first volume has data about birds nesting here in the state from the late 70s to the early 80s. And the second volume has breeding statistics from 2002 to 2007. So there's a really good comparison of what birds were around in the state. And this leads to resources. 
Both volumes of the Vermont Breeding Bird Atlas are available as hardbound books in many libraries and in many people's homes, including our own. And the second volume, the newer one, is also available online. The Cornell Lab of Ornithology has a wonderful site called allaboutbirds.org. For each species, there are photos, helpful identification tips, measurements, sounds to listen to, maps showing where the birds are at different times of the year, information about life habits and nesting and habitat, some fun facts. There's also information about whether the population of that bird is increasing or decreasing and what is being done to help if it's at risk. And Zeno Canto, I just love. It has sounds for just about any bird you can think of here or anywhere on earth. Just type in the name of the bird you'd like to hear and you'll find a whole list of recordings with information about the location and time of day that that recording was made. Uh, just be sure to type in the full common name, American Robin, for instance, rather than just Robin. eBird is a humongous database of information about what birds are being seen where, again, all over the world. Let's say you wanna know where people in Jericho are seeing Baltimore Orioles. Well, you can go to eBird, click on Explore, choose Vermont, and then Chittenden County, and you will get a long list of every bird that's ever been seen in Chittenden County. Find Baltimore Oriole on the list, click on the little symbol to the right of the name, and you'll see a map with a whole lot of teardrop shapes. A red teardrop means a recent sighting. So click on it and you will see exactly where that Baltimore Oriole was and exactly when, you'll even see who saw it. And there are a lot of field guides, of course. You can get them in libraries or buy them in stores. Many people have old field guides in their homes. A lot of birders think that these two listed here are all that you're ever gonna need. The Sibley Guide to Eastern Birds, you can get it as a book or as an app for your phone. And the Peterson Field Guide to Eastern Bird Nests, which also has pictures and descriptions of eggs. There's another good field guide app called the Audubon Bird Guide, and that one's free, whereas the Sibley app costs money. I mentioned Merlin earlier. You can download it for free onto your phone, and it will identify bird sounds with an astonishing degree of accuracy. It can also help identify a bird that you saw but didn't hear. You just answer a few questions and the app will come up with some good suggestions about what the bird might have been. And you can learn so much for bird by birding with others. Several organizations host monthly or occasional uh, outings during spring, summer, and fall. You can che check the websites for Green Mountain Audubon Society, Missisquoi National Wildlife Refuge, which has monthly walks, North Branch Nature Center in East Montpelier, and two places that are right next to each other in Huntington, the Green Mountain Audubon Center and the Birds of Vermont Museum. And of course, there's printed material that isn't field guides. There's just a vast amount of books about birds. Um, I started looking up nature books for toddlers and young children and other kids to include some recommendations, but I was boggled by the quantity. There are storybooks and nonfiction books and books full of lesson plans and activities and so much more. Just ask any librarian for suggestions or go to the blue address, web address on this slide, birdwatchinghq.com slash best bird books. <laughs> I can give a few recommendations about nature books for adults though, because Bernie and I read a lot. A Vermont author, whoops, Bernd Heinrich has written a lot of books about birds and, and I have read and loved One Man's Owl about raising an owl in the house, Ravens in Winter, The Mind of the Raven, The Geese of Beaver Bog, Winter World, and there are I think a dozen other ones. When Heinrich raised his owl, he had to deal with mess and danger and constant demands on his time and energy. Another book about raising an injured owl is the delightful 
Wesley the Owl, full of owl wisdom and human wisdom, as well as humor and sorrow. And a fascinating and eye-opening book is that The Genius of Birds by Jennifer Ackerman. After reading this book, I guarantee you will use the word bird brain as a compliment. The Thing with Feathers by Noah Stryker is also about bird intelligence and is pretty mind-boggling. <clears throat> One more, a couple more suggestions. The Big Year is a fictionalized true story that was made into a more fictionalized movie with Steve Martin and Jack Black and others. But it's fascinating because it's about the truly obsessive behavior that can happen if you get too much into birding about three men who gave up all their normal life to try to see as many species as possible in one year. And another book about that same obsession is Kingbird Highway. And this is true. It's about a teenager who hitchhiked all over the country with almost no money, sometimes eating nothing but cat kibble just to see birds. And there are some movies about birds. The Big Year is enjoyable, although not nearly as good as the book. Another good book, Red Tales in Love, was made into the documentary Pale Male. It's all about a red-tailed hawk that nested for several years on a really ritzy high-rise apartment building across the street from New York City's Central Park. Some of the famous residents didn't much like bird poop and bits of de dead pigeons littering their extremely pricey surroundings but others got hooked on watching Pale Male and his mate and their youngsters. And the book shows how interest in nature formed a bond between the very wealthy and a few of the city's homeless citizens. A few years later, the interest in that book and that documentary led to a second longer film called The Central Park Effect. The Wild Parrots of Telegraph Hill also focuses on the interactions of humans who become interested in birds. And winged migration puts the viewer right in the middle of flocks of migrating birds, hearing the wind in their wings, seeing the earth below. I haven't seen the last film on this slide yet, but I included it because it is re receiving glowing reviewers, reviews rather, from bird lovers and film lovers alike. And there's one more film. It's a Disney film called Penguins or March of the Penguins. I don't know why it has two names. Some people were put off by the trademark Disney cuteness, but there is a lot of accurate information about life at the bottom of the world in Antarctica. And I found it delightful and touching to watch the dedicated penguin parents raising young in such a very inhospitable environment. And here's a brand new Jericho program designed for introducing our local nature to adults and children and introducing the adults and children to the local nature. Jay Finn, Jericho Families in Nature, will feature nature walks this spring and summer. The focus will be on exploration and discovery. Discoveries made by every single participant, no matter how old. We will notice trees and ferns and rocks and wildflowers and pond scum and insects and animal tracks and birds and anything else in nature. Keep watching Bernie Puckett's Jericho community blog for updated information such as dates and locations for walks. And I hope many of you visit us at Vermont Birds and Words. There are posts about birds here in Jericho, a lot of them, and elsewhere in Vermont, and in Massachusetts and Georgia and Arizona. There are photos of Vermont's winter birds and birds we can see during spring migration. There's information about upcoming classes and programs and walks. And if you click on resources, you get lots of suggestions about places to go birding, places to take your kayaks or canoes, when Vermont's birds are nesting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm hoping this video and the first one about Jericho's ABC birds inspires many watchers to get outside and to notice the birds around us. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs>